Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. I very much appreciate uh, Don's openness and hospitality. Thank you for the nice intro. And as usual, let us begin our Dharma session tonight with the mantra of the universe and its purity, Om Nam, seven times. Om Nam Om Nam Om Nam Thank you for Will's introductory. When you hear him speak, is this soft, compassionate voice, and then there's a sentence that cuts right through it. Tonight, which one was that sentence? When you meet Buddha, kill Buddha, he said. Sounds pretty brash. But in the Bible, there's an interesting saying in the Old Testament, do not have other gods before me. And that was not just about polytheism. It was also about images, statues, any kind of symbols that are to be taken away so that you and God could actually become one. That you would worship the right one. In Zen, we don't worship. But we also take any image of the Buddha away. Because if it appears in a form, if it has color, if it has smell, if it's something you can see or hear, that's not true Buddha. That's not our substance. Our substance is not created. If it's created, it's not our substance. So that's why in Zen we come back to the point of no thinking. Because our thinking creates everything. And there is a mindset, there is a state of mind which is before thinking, before creation, therefore before life and death. And if you want to attain that, you do not have to become someone else. In fact, you can attain that better if you take life as it is, in its ordinariness, in its suchness, without altering it. And then, if you practice, you can come back to this point. When you hear the sound, there is no thinking. That moment, you as a separate self did not exist. Buddha as an entity did not exist. Your mind as something that creates this world did not exist. There was just the state that we call don't know. We call it don't know mind because it's the closest to the truth. But if I open my mouth to talk about it, I already make a mistake. If I do not lead you to the edge of the experience, I also make a mistake. So if I stay silent, the great Zen master hits me 30 times. If I open my mouth, the great Zen master also hits me 30 times. What can we do? Perceive that the sky is blue, the trees are green, and the sun sets at this hour. If you attain substance, you attain truth. And without attaining substance, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror, we cannot attain truth. There is no way that we could see it clearly, or hear it clearly, or feel it clearly. And if we attain truth, we also attain correct function. That function 
tells us moment to moment what our job here is on earth. If you look deep and you ask yourself, why am I here? What's the purpose of my life? And to continue with something just as direct as that sentence in Will's intro, Zen Master Sung San was asked about the purpose of life. And he said, if you look at life very closely, originally it has no reason, no meaning, and you have no choice. And everybody was shocked. This is a country of freedom and choice and competition. What else? And he continued, but if you attain your true nature, great meaning, great reason, and great choice all appear. So as long as we are preoccupied with our own ideas, and we believe we can afford to be selfish, only small reasons appear that can change over time. And deep inside you realize you have nothing. You were born, you grow up, you get old, and we all die. In other words, we have no choice. Small choices we can make. Which plaza do you use for your shopping? Which car do you choose at the dealership? But in great questions, unless you go beyond life and death, you have no choice. Because we didn't attain that mind that can truly make a choice. To give you a metaphor, if you take off from any airport, you have to go through that zone, that altitude, which is very shaky, where you have turbulence. That's up to about like 18,000 feet. And beyond that, the turbulence begins to, to stop. And when you reach 30,000 feet, it's actually clear blue. 36,000 feet, which is our usual cruising altitude over the Atlantic, is totally clear. The sky is completely blue. Barely any turbulence, if any. So the mind can do the same thing. And remember, you do not have two minds. One thinking mind and one no thinking mind. You have only one mind, which is either thinking or not thinking. Very interesting, because the mirror can either break itself under the weight of its own reflection, or it can stay clear and strong and even moment to moment. Zen has very interesting methods, besides being very direct, taking away all the symbols, the intermediary images, the thinking about Buddha, it's all gone. It's all brought back to zero. Besides that, we have the Kongan practice that is dealing with paradoxes. Paradoxes have questions that your usual thinking habits cannot answer. Kongan practice forces you to return to don't know, to attain clarity, to be clear like space, clear like a mirror, and then you can reflect. It's a state of non-duality. It's a state of clarity, which is operational as well. This clarity, non-duality, is called Wu Wei in Chinese, the non-acting state of the mind. And when you see clearly, hear clearly, taste, smell, touch, etc., clearly, that's when the mind is operational. It's reflecting the world as it is. And the third step, the function, is also there, because when somebody is hungry, you give that person food. When somebody is thirsty, you give that person drink. So this non-action is actually a state of non-duality, not laziness, not refraining from the right thing to do. When the mind is not thinking as well as thinking at the same time, we can do this. We call that way wu way, acting non-action. But it's important to see that at the core there is no self, there is no engine, there is no special routine or belief or idea. The core is clear like space, clear like a mirror. And that's as far as explanations can go. We can walk around it in circles for hours. In fact, humanity has been walking around this in circles for thousands of years. What are those paths that lead you to the experience? Most paths stop with beliefs. So after a while, you have to believe. And that's it. It's beyond dispute. That's where the absolute declaration comes instead of the experience. And absolute declarations close down the mind. It's like a brick wall, no doors. 
Instead, look for the opening in the mind, in the conceptual framework. And if that doctrine leads you to the experience, then it's open. It makes you autonomous. It doesn't take your freedom. It doesn't chain your mind through beliefs and dogmas. And that's why if you take away the image of God, you meet God very soon. If you kill Buddha, you become Buddha very soon. And in Zen, we have a very clear practice which is centered around this sentence, less is more. We do not have very complicated methods. We do not encourage people to have large academic knowledge. Just be your ordinary self as you are and try to perceive where that comes from. Where do your thoughts come from? Where do your emotions come from? And if you stop thinking for a second, where is yourself? Where is your image of yourself? So asking the right question gets you further. That's why in Zen we are loaded with questions, sometimes paradoxical questions that totally disable the thinking engine. And then you return to something greater than that, something simpler than that, something completely selfless, clear, and out of this experience comes what we all desire for, but we cannot get without going through the gate of no thinking. We all want loving kindness, compassion, wisdom, welfare, good companionship, everything you read in the Noble Eightfold Path, which begins with correct, correct view, correct livelihood, correct effort, correct speech, correct action. It's actually the way out of suffering. If you see where this appears is the fourth of the Four Noble Truths. But without attaining, you don't get it. You only think you got it. Experience makes you spiritually autonomous. Only acquiring some doctrine, some thinking, makes you maybe a good believer, but you're not walking on the path. You're on somebody else's vehicle that is driven for you, and you're not partaking in it. So Zen is always uh, the path of the doers and the walkers, and not so much the talkers. So that's why I stop talking now and encourage you to ask any questions that you may have. What is the role of meditation in all this? Why is meditation necessary? In any Expedient way? means. It's a method which was used by tens of millions of practitioners over time to turn the energy inward and find the answers within. Meditation is an indispensable method to lose our illusions of the world and ourselves. In many schools, primarily in meditation-oriented schools, you have two key concepts. One is stop, and the second is look, okay? In Korean, it's called Kan Hua Son. In other places, it's called Shamatha Vipassana. In every practical meditation school, irrespective of culture, language, and age of practicing, you have to still the mind. That's when the ripples on the surface of the lake, they get smoothed out. You do not willfully think anymore. You do not consciously think and you let your thinking just run out. And that's when the ripples, the waves on the surface of the lake, they stop, they become even. And the second step, the reflection or perception, that's when it happens. So as long as you have the waves of your own karma, the lake surface doesn't reflect the sky, the birds, and the willow tree, clearly. And the moment that stops, you actually perceive. So these are the two steps. Stop the thinking of the mind and perceive. Does that have to be seated? Or is this not, people talk about they're doing meditation when they're doing golf or something like that. You know, so what's the, what's the difference here? What's the tension between? Huge. Object-oriented meditation can only come when what we call pure meditation has reached a certain level. Otherwise, it's just a pretense. I believe I'm doing meditation, but 
the mind is not clear. You didn't go to your subconscious and your mantra or your question didn't clean up your karma. Not yet. Not deep enough. So object-oriented meditation happens only when you have done enough formal practice. Before that, it's just an occupation. It's a hobby. It's something that focuses your mind on an object or a series of objects or a process instead of your own things inside. And that's a temporary relief. That's why when we play golf or uh, we go sailing or we do something really pleasurable, it takes your mind off the usual course, the usual routine. We need that. But it doesn't go deep enough. If we practice meditation in a traditional way, using traditional methods, it goes way, way deeper. And that depth is necessary. When that depth is reached, then everything can become meditation, bit by bit, step by step, but not before. We shouldn't kid ourselves. Next question. I have been coming here a couple of months, maybe a little more, and um, I had real monkey mind. You know monkey mind? No. You don't? We all have it. We Which all? mind is not a monkey? We all want bananas. <laughs> okay, so go on. Okay. We understand monkey very well. I, everybody has monkey mind. Uh, mm -hmm. But the meditation helps me in segments, like, like you said. It's temporary. It happens, and, it feel, and then it comes monkey again, you know. But I have been able to uh, be quiet more. Just like when driving, not to have noise everywhere. And at home, not to have a television on and just... That's very good karma. Being, just being with my two cats. It's so beautiful. No dogs, only cats. Oh, yeah, only So two. then the, it's really quiet in the house. Oh, very quiet. Yeah. And today I was play. I found music to calm cats. Music that cats love. And I, I played it for them for about an hour. It was an eight-hour thing. It was, it was good for me, too. It was good, you know, for... It was so peaceful and so wonderful. And I felt oh, kind of alive when it, I got through with doing all that. Mm -hmm. It was nice. Uh, but I guess I just wanted to say I didn't realize everybody has monkey mind. We all do. We all do. What's your question about the monkey? About the monkey? Yeah. I just want to get rid of the monkey. You don't get rid of the monkey. You no. tame it. You train it. I would love, yeah, I'm training. Are we training okay. the monkey? Yes, we are training the monkey. Okay. okay. Uh, the first is catch the monkey and uh, show the true nature of life and death. And in Africa, they do it in many ways. But one is that they have a jar, and the jar has a very, very uh, narrow neck. And when the monkey reaches in, there's a banana. And if the monkey catches the banana, the paw becomes too big to pull out. The hunter comes because that jar is tied to a tree. It's not a metaphor, it's a real thing. When you want something, Zen teaches you to get it first inside. So internalize the banana and don't run around. That's when you realize that no matter what you do, you will die. Because the hunter is coming. Time does not wait for you. And then the monkey becomes less selfish, less agitated, less ambitious, less screaming, because as long as you're holding onto the banana, it doesn't let you go. You're staying here on earth, suffering, being happy, making others suffer, making others happy, but the banana is in your hand, in your paw. If you completely become empty and let go of your ideas, then there's a chance you can pull the paw out. Okay, that's original freedom. So training the monkey starts with actually trying to satisfy the desire first and realizing that it's impossible. Instead, there's a series of experiences and one of them is that we are temporary. We don't live forever. We are staying in the body for a very short time because 60, 70, even 80 or 90 years is not that long compared to the rest of nature. Even compared to our compromises in life. Deep inside, we don't want to die. 
we really want to live forever. And the way we handle this is training the monkey. Showing the monkey the nature of the jungle is important. That's how we learn cause and effect. In some other you know, schools or lines of thought, the monkey is made feel guilty, that you're guilty because you're a monkey. No, guilt doesn't work. Sometimes you are rewarded because you're a monkey. That means your other paw goes into another jar and now two are caught. Not so good, okay? Zen is very simple. Ask one question, who are you? Really? Sung San Sunim had a very wonderful Dharma heir. His name was Subong Sunim. He's not alive, unfortunately, anymore. He used to teach on the East Coast as well. And one day they took a boat ride in Hudson Bay. It was a typical excursion in the New York area. And uh, there were some media folks on the boat. One of them was going around with a cameraman and they shot some weird interviews where the title question was, what is the most disgusting thing in the world? And they kept asking people. So they got this to Bong Sunim. You know, he was bald, wearing similar clothing. It looked like an interesting guy. So, sir, can I have a question? Yeah, no problem. What is the most disgusting thing in the world? And he asked him, who are you? Well, I'm an anchor. I work for this and this station. And I want to ask you this question, if you don't mind. And Subong Sunim goes, who are you? It's just your job that you talked about. Well, you know, I live here, I have a wife, I have children. And then he went on about his personal life, you know, that layer that can be presented there. And then Subong Sim says, I didn't ask about your life. I asked, who are you? And this went on for a while, several layers. And Subong Sim was relentless. And this guy got caught like the monkey with the paw and the banana. And finally, after a few minutes, he came to this kind of shocking realization inside. I don't know. Subong Sunim just stripped his mind bare of all the concepts and ideas. And when he said, I don't know, Subong Sunim just got back to him and said, you don't know who you are? That's the most disgusting thing in the world. Other questions? Yeah, back there, sir. Well, in Buddhism in general, but Zen meditation or Zen, Zen Buddhism, how does the, the concept of love fit in? It, it, where is that? It's between sentient beings, love, and it fits very well. Without that, we really couldn't exist as human beings. But what is important that we attain great love instead of just having this small selfish love. How do you know? Small love is riddled with uh, burdens, discriminations, very strong dualistic mind. Great love doesn't have that. Okay? You love all beings. And besides that, you keep your life very clear, your commitments very clear, your relationships very committed. So great love is the answer, and that doesn't come without sufficiently cleaning your mind out. When that happens, the experience of oneness is the root of love, not just your like and dislike mind. This experience of no thinking gives you the oneness experience. That's original love. The rest follows, the rest is just karma. Compassion works in the same way. Wisdom works in the same way. Out of this oneness experience or the no self experience comes non-dualistic wisdom, selfless compassion, there are wonderful words and expressions to communicate that. But if we don't attain that, it doesn't become ours. We can't manifest that. It doesn't become a value system inside. That's why we practice. Without doing it, it's not going to work. Could you talk more about correctness? I struggle that it's only a word, but it, it, implies a dualistic approach that if there is correctness, there is incorrectness, and someone else decides it. 
I think. You think someone else decides it? Maybe. I. I would you could, like someone else to decide no, it? No, I would not like that. Then decide it for yourself. That's correct, correct. When you use your own eyes, you use your own ears, you use your own heart and mind to decide what is correct and then see the result. And when you run into the wall of unsolvable problems or you just made somebody feel bad because your correctness inside wasn't clear, then you see the mind needs some training. The monkey is still screaming. We all have the capability to decide what is correct and what is not correct. In Buddhism or Zen, anything that creates suffering is not correct. And everything that is bringing us back to loving kindness, wisdom, etc. is correct. So in that sense, it's very clear, but it's a general statement, moment to moment, what is correct. You know, just tell me someone who loves to go to the dentist. And the dentist knows that any kind of pain inflicted upon you is for a greater purpose and it's not intentional. And you know that too, yet it hurts. But that's not suffering. If somebody hurts you, even without touching you, just hurts your feelings, hurts your sense of freedom, hurts your well-being, hurts you financially or legally, that's really the intent, and that's what decides it. So it's very incorrect. Although it's very, sometimes people smile, they come in with a nice briefcase, and they look very good, and they sit on the other side of the table, and they hurt you so bad. So correct means getting out of suffering. Incorrect is making more suffering. And if you look at it that way, where are you in that equation, moment to moment? then you can decide it very well for yourself. You can see how you operate. You can see your karma. And that realization is pretty much part of our practice. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I understand that uh, pain is with us. Mm. And uh, what we do with pain uh, is suffering. Uh, in other words, uh, suffering is a process. And we can... Like you link pain with suffering, and I don't blame you for that. I'm sorry? You link pain with suffering, and I don't blame you for that, but they are not the same, and they are not necessarily connected. No, I don't. There is pain without suffering, like the dentist, if you approach it in the right way, and there is suffering without pain, a lot of it. Well, well, that, that's, that's an aspect I've never thought of. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, but Buddhism accepts that life is painful. Life can be painful. It's not necessarily painful. Life is suffering because we all die. But some people die gracefully, some people die very, very ruefully. So it's up to us how we live and die. There is some pain involved, but how much that makes you suffer, that's up to you. Also, some people cannot take pleasure. Okay? Pleasure is supposed to make us happy. And you meet people where pleasure is ruled out because they refuse happiness, they refuse the whole feeling, okay? Birth, old age, sickness, and death. These are the four main suffering. There's four minor suffering too. But these four main ones, they are connected. However, they are not identical. Some people are in pain and they don't die for years. Some people are not in pain and suddenly they just leave the body. They're gone. So don't identify pain with suffering. But if you do, that's very natural. Vice versa. Pleasure and happiness, they are linked, but they are not the same. See cause and effect clearly. Where does pain come from? Pretty simple. Where does suffering come from? That's more complex. Where does pleasure come from? That's also pretty simple. Where does happiness come from? More complex. Look at your own self-image when you were 15, and then look at it when you were 50. Look at your own concept of happiness when you were 20 and 30 years later. The two concepts are radically different. Yeah, there's an overlap, but not much. Are there levels of awareness in Zen? Uh, some other disciplines talk about jhanas, which I think sort of relate to 
graduated or, or perhaps uh, even unrelated levels, but they talk about those, if you could talk about that. You were here before, yes. during one of my talks at least, maybe more, yeah. and you are practicing. Yeah. What did your teacher say about the four kinds of jhanas? Well, actually, the, the uh, jhanas I've got through reading, there's a, a book called uh, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha that's okay. interesting. I'd never seen the, the, uh, the core text of this before, but it uh, was explicitly discussed, you know, in terms of uh, the different levels and then being able to kind okay. of... Um, in your own practice, do you have a teacher? I do. Did you ask your teacher about the four levels of jhanas? Uh, not directly, no. My teacher's in the Tibetan. Uh, Understood. Discipline. Okay. But, uh, and some of these things are, you know, done over time mm -hmm. and with, I guess, readiness. And you talked about being 15 versus 50. Yeah. Um, and, and readiness for being able to take on the next discipline. For instance, I've experienced, I guess, kind of an empty mind, somewhat blissful. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that I was wise or <laughs> I, I was empty but um, I'm just th there are techniques I think that uh, I'm interested in All right. exploring over time what color is the ceiling white which level of jhana is this uh, I, I don't think it's a jhana I think it's uh, you don't think so so uh, when you see clearly and you use this emptiness it's not related to meditation okay could be. Please don't get caught by conceptual frameworks. That's why we keep discussing this. Conceptual frameworks are relative. They're significant in a certain tradition like Theravada or some aspects of Tibetan meditation. In Zen, we do not use the levels. I can tell you about that because I also read something about it. I also experienced what it means to have just the stream of your mind, the stream of your karma is the first level of jhana. The Shrota Apana is the stream enterer, okay? First, when you turn your energy inwards, you see something which you haven't seen before. Is this unedited movie inside. Not just sounds, not just images, but all kinds of stuff that your storehouse consciousness you know, keeps underneath the threshold. And we spent quite a lot of time cleaning that up. So that stream is actually our archetypal reality that is always bombarding us from beneath. If you do this really well, then in Theravada, they say you get to the next level, which is the Shakri Dagamin, which is returning only once more to human body. And then the third one is the Anagamin, the non-returners. And the fourth is the Arahan, the completely pure. There's technical problems with this as well. Also, the theoretical distinction between the third and the fourth is not really meaningful. And those who use these, like in Burma, Myanmar, and Thailand, they have huge commentaries about it. I don't touch that. But in Zen, substance, truth, and function, which I have spoken about tonight. These are the three aspects, like the three legs of a tripod. They are not in a sequential order. You can start with any of them, and you need the other two very soon. So the four levels of jhanas, if you zoom out a little bit, it's like the seventh stage of yoga practice. If you look at it from a kind of Vedanta perspective, you have the yama and the niyama, the do's and the don'ts, the first two, asana and pranayama, the physical exercises and the breathing exercises. And the fifth is pratyahara, turning the senses inwards. That means the monkey is not running around looking for more and more bananas. You turn your focus inside, that's pratyahara. And dharana is finding the mind object and not letting it go. That's when the banana becomes virtual. It's not real, and you know it. It's a meditation method that has no substance. And the seventh is jhana. You can blow up the seventh into four, the four levels. 
But it doesn't matter how many levels of jhanas you define, if it leads to oneness, the eighth, which is samadhi, absorption, extinction, literally. So when you enter true samadhi through jhana, your self is extinguished. In how many steps do you do that? It's irrelevant. Okay? You can do it in four, you can do it in more or less. What's important is how you keep your mind clear moment to moment. The Theravadins do seem to have explicit huge techniques. This big. And you know, I've considered doing a 10-day retreat to be able to practice. And, and the perception I have is that it could improve my meditation <laughs> technique, uh, aside from samadhi. Um, but... Um, it anyway. certainly will. So I encourage everybody in this room, if you happen to like a certain school or a meditation, try it. No risks. The only risk is that you will see your karma. That's all. Thank you. You're welcome. I have long thought that we, as a, as a species, are a duality. We are a human being, a separation of the two, human being the body and the existence of everything about us and the being, the soul that is part of the universe. It is the energy of the universe which we are. In that context, tell me what you think happens to that being when I pass away. First, I really want to know where this being came from with all these dualities loaded. The being has always been. It is not just, you know, it exists in the universe. Okay, so without knowing where it came from, we really cannot tell where it goes. The Alpha and the Omega meet at the same point. What our purpose is with all these dualities in our consciousness, that's ours to determine. But if you want the larger view, the broader view, then let me draw your attention to the 16 unanswered questions of the Buddha, which is centered around four issues. Is the universe finite or infinite? Do human beings have a perpetual existence or, or only temporary? I.e. we are going through lifetime after lifetime forever, or we can stop this. The third is about the gods. You know, do they exist without our belief in them? Are they the figments of our imagination or are they for real? Okay. And the fourth is usually something I forget because it's not so important. So the 16 unanswered questions of the Buddha actually are answered. He answered with silence. And most Westerners overlook that. He answered it. He answered with silence. Why? As much as I respect everybody's questions and I'm trying to give you a meaningful answer, some questions are really metaphysical, like this one. What we do with our dualities, our karma here and now, is important. Where we go after we die depends on that, if you care to believe that. But if you do not believe that there's anything after we pass on, still, this life, as we live it, is important. It's the only thing we have in this setup. This body, this mind will never come together again. Even if you believe in reincarnation, your next body will be different. And it depends on the kind of karma that you make here and you carry over. But you do not have to believe in reincarnation to be a good practitioner. In Zen, certainly not. Okay? So why did the Buddha answer with silence? Because if you attain our true nature, the swabhava, the self-existing, okay, the non-dual mind, the unborn mind, there's many names to it, the non-self also, the anatman, okay, which the Hindus call the atma brahman, the supreme self. Nonetheless, if you attain it, then you wouldn't ask the question, because the answer would be clear. But if you still have to ask the question, then you wouldn't understand the answer. And that's why he answered with silence. How could I be better than the Buddha? It's impossible. Next question. Two weeks ago, I think it was um, in here, and uh, someone was reading from one of the readings, like they do before uh, we meditate, and it, something caught 
me, and I kept thinking about it and thinking about it, is non-referential ease. Non-referential ease? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well. I, I mean, now I'm like your cat. You play the music and I'm relaxed and I don't make <laughs> any noise. I like this non-referential ease. It's non it's beautiful. Though, it's beautiful. I just want to purr, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so then, there's no more questions. What what can I do for you? You can be silent. Would you like me to? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I mean, to me, because I started thinking about that. <gasps> then the ease is gone. The ease is then gone. Then the reference point appears. Go back to cat, okay? <laughs> Cats have this non-referential oh. ease after they are fed and they're cared for. Oh. You played the music and they're, they're so natural. Go back to the cat. Okay. The non-referential ease appears again. Again. And thinking disappears. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yes. Any then, questions left? One little thing. Go, go, on, go. Okay. On. Yeah. Now the banana appears. Go on. Okay. Uh, to me, I was trying to figure out, okay, how does that, what is that to me? What is non-referential ease? It is like when I see someone just walking down the street and my automatic, the automatic thing is for me in my mind, this is part of the monkey, is to, you know, just go uh, summarize what I've, just passed on the street, you know, the things. Yeah, I know. That's this automatic thing, this autopilot of our karma. Sometimes bad surprises appear. Yeah. But uh, the more you meditate and the more you work... If you don't toward... want to grab the banana, then you have non-referential ease yes. or just being here, being present. And then you can really see that the sky is blue, the trees are green, can hear the dogs barking and the cat meowing. So a mind that doesn't abide anywhere and doesn't depend on anything, that's the non-referential part, okay? Ease doesn't need any explanation because all your tension is gone. So then you're just present clearly, being aware, but there is no special object of awareness, no ambition, no willpower. No judgment. Absolutely not. That's good. And uh, if it disappears and your autopilot appears and the monkey wants to grab the banana again, cat music. Okay? <laughs> good. Thanks. Here, Greg. Thank you for your instruction. As an empty vessel, I would like to ask a question, I think it's a question, about the concept of universal consciousness or the ground of being. After you go through the bardo, or whatever construct you wish, go through the five realms, and you pass. If you become reborn in some way and you go through the whole system again, whatever, all of it ends up in eventually falling into, and this is the question, the universal consciousness of all things, like the Shinto, being in everything. I believe that is so. I cannot prove it. I have not lived it. I would like you to tell me, my question is, what do you think of it? Or have I, once again, fooled myself? You attain this, you attain no mind. When your individual mind is extinguished, you attain great mind. That great mind is no mind. And we can term that universal consciousness, the divine self, Atma Brahman, Anatman, whichever you prefer. But originally it has no name and no form, and this is where we stop. I would like to give you a metaphor, which is, again, putting our minds at ease. The water drop returns to the ocean and becomes the ocean. Now, that's an experience we can have when we meditate. 
But if you start to reference it, if you start to think about it, then the drop separates itself from the ocean again. Evaporates because of its own heat. And then it becomes separate. And you have to lose this thinking, you have to lose the conceptualization that puts you into this vortex to become one with the ocean again. So if you attain no thinking, then you become one with question mark. We have so many names for it, but we don't know it. We can experience it, but the moment you start to think about it, you become separate again. And that's why you have these magnanimous statements, go with the flow, or all kinds of you know, reference points here, just to take away this individual thinking. And this thinking is important as long as we keep it in the correct view. Correct view is part of the Noble Eightfold Path. And that means your thinking is relative and you make it. And if you make it, you have it. If you don't make it, you don't have it. Very simple. So only without thinking, just like this is Buddha, and I quoted my late teacher, the final answer does not have any concepts. Nothing whatsoever. You'll have to excuse me, I was no. thinking of nothing. If you were thinking, it wasn't nothing. The point is that if you think, your sense of I appears. If you don't think, your sense of I disappears. But it doesn't reduce your quality of being. In fact, it increases it. And that's where the paradox comes. By extinguishing your own walls of the self, you become one with the universe. And what that is like, no one can credibly describe it. But their presence changes. Their lives change. Even their speech and actions, they all change. And if that inspires you, you can follow the path which they follow. Don't follow the person. Follow what the person followed. So we don't know. Honestly, sincerely, we don't know. But if we attain this don't know, we actually attain what we never thought of, never could have wanted, but it's greater than anything we could have thought and wanted. All right? May it be so. So I'm in this uh, group that reads short stories to each other. And one of the short stories we came across was about this boy going up into the mountains with his father and his brother to collect blueberries. On the way back, he gets into a wrestling match with his brother. In that moment, he realizes that the mountains are alive around him, and that the owls, the, 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 the animals that he's hearing, and everything like that, that the trees, the winds, the leaves rustling, and that he himself, wrestling with his brother, is alive. So he's kind of like bursting and very, very full of this, and says to his brother, did you know you're alive? And his brother says, yeah, well, yeah, right, of course I'm alive. How do you begin to discuss something like that? I don't. It's a nice story. And that's it, it is a nice story, but it's, 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 it's part of the, uh, you know, it's part of the, that uh, divergence is, uh, you know, part of that difficulty in, in expressing the communication of experiencing the world without a, uh, without a filter or a sense of eye. Don't make anything. Then you have no filters. The moment of wrestling, all the filters are gone because you have to wrestle with your bro. You know you can't hurt him. He's your brother. Also, it's not good if you lose because it just puts you right into the mud. In Zen, we say, don't make anything. The world, including the story, is already complete. Absorb it. Feel it. Of course, you can discuss it with your friends, but originally that discussion is not necessary. So we say, don't make anything, don't make any ideas, don't make a second layer or a third layer on top of the primary perception of reality, both inside and outside. And if you don't make anything, then you are also not holding anything. So people have projections and ideas, and mostly it invites some memory from the past. It's connected to some past karma. And then they're holding it, and their memory soon gets filled with it. They become attached to it. And that's where the third instruction comes. Don't attach to this. Because if you make something, hold something, attach to something, soon you get so much worried 
that you check the world around you all the time, all the time, whether am I right? Is the world right? Am I happy? Is the other person happy? This checking, 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 like that's a monkey. A monkey with 10,000 paws, you know, everywhere, meddling, messing, worried, checking, controlling, all the time. And then we always want the wrong thing. So don't make, don't hold, don't attach, don't check, don't want. These are self-makers. They are huge ego makers. And this wanting is your selfish wanting, not really wanting to help other beings. Catch it at the very root when you make something. When you make an idea, this world is already complete, as it is. Discussion, secondary, tertiary layers, they're not really adding, they are clouding, okay? Is doing meditation making a second layer? The dog runs after the bone. Sorry, that's too quick for me. The dog runs after the bone. That means you just got a Zen sentence, okay? Uh, I gave you good teaching, and your idea reappeared again. When that reappears, it's like the dog running after the idea. So meditation is totally empty. It can go either way. You do it in the right way, you have less illusions. You do meditation in the wrong way, you have more illusions. That's where Westerners make huge mistakes. They think meditation is like an autopilot. No, it's not. It's not a system. It's a double-edged sword. So with meditation, if you do it in the right way, you can cut your illusions and your path becomes unimpeded, unhindered. But if you do meditation in the wrong way, your sense of self, your own precious ego becomes stronger and you just cut yourself, you hurt yourself. So do meditation in the right way, use the sword carefully. There is no predetermined path when you start practicing. In fact, your predetermined karma grows less and less and less. You become more free, but with that freedom, there has to be more responsibility as well. Okay? So this goes very far. Is meditation right or wrong? No. The way you do it is either correct or incorrect. More suffering? Incorrect. More happiness? Correct. You've probably had this question a lot of times, but I'm going to ask you, define life. Should I define life? You are alive talking to me. No. Okay. Define life. Universal. I'm interested in your definition of what life is. Oh, yeah. Sitting on this very comfortable chair, talking with you. Okay. Now that's my life. But if you want more definition, more abstract and more scientific, I just say, go ask a cat. It's not necessary. Moment to moment, what are you doing? What kind of body? What kind of mind do you have? That's life. It's plenty to work on. Zen doesn't have these huge scientific or religious definitions that would actually incarcerate you eventually when you try to get out of them. Why define life? Live it. Okay. Then the next portion of that, what is its purpose? Yeah, we already talked about it. Originally, no purpose. You can give purpose to it. Is there a correct or right ambition? Yes, there is. What is it? Your ambition is not for yourself, but for all beings. That's the correct ambition. If you practice just for yourself, soon it burns on you. It's like a coat that you can never take off. If you practice for all beings, it becomes this universal whole coat where all beings find their place in your heart. This kasa, we call this de kasa in Korean. When you become a monk, they teach you the meaning of this. This has seven folds, okay? And there is a kongan. At the sound of the bell, why do you put on your seven-fold robe? The bell is the beginning of the ceremony in every temple in Korea and China and probably in Japan too. So it's universal responsibility which we have towards all beings that manifests through our minds. And the reason why we practice is this great ambition to wake up and save all beings from suffering. It's the ultimate. There is no other ambition. And the sign of universal responsibility that you take this upon yourself is the Dekasa. Now, as lay people, you do not need special robes for that. So there's no need for special robe, but there is a need for the right view, the right mind. 
that through our actions, our speech, our thoughts and feelings, we are responsible for each other. That's life. Without this great ambition, we remain just selfish, just limited. And in the worst possible moment, this selfish ambition just crashes on us because it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The basics is if I help this world, the world helps me. If I want help, I have to give help first. If I want happiness, I have to try and strive to make this world a better place. And look at the way we want to be happy. We want to have, you know, reasonably affluent living. We take, we acquire, we don't return, we don't recycle. So carelessly, selfishly, human beings will have a very, very short lifespan on this earth as a species. Miserable, loaded with improductive contradictions. Not the right paradoxes, but contradictions that actually crush us because we never rose above ourselves. So the right ambition is not for me, but for all beings. Adi Ashante uh, went in his backyard in California, sat in a tent, and eventually awakened. As a young man in Eastern Europe, would you open to your story of how you started to awaken? I had a couple of unresolved questions that ballooned into a big crisis. I didn't stop before I found the right answers. And the answers turned out to be the path of Zen. Not really preset or pre-made answers, but something that you find on your way as you practice. To be more specific, all of you have been to at least one theater performance in your life, maybe more. And you see the actors on stage. And those actors, if they do it right, then they really believe that they are Henry IV when they play a Shakespeare drama, or they are Romeo and Juliet. And you see that perfect characterization, because if it's the right acting, you transform. And that transformation transforms you in the audience. That transformational experience is catharsis in Greek. Namely, it's purification, but through the transformation you are purified of your fixed sense of yourself. That you are just this and you cannot change. And that realization that you are playing roles in all your life, that was part of this. In my early 20s, I started to ask these questions. We all play roles. Who are we really? Where is the director? I could have chosen many kinds of jobs in my life, but I didn't want to take one before I know who the director is. It turns out that the director is not a who, it's a what. The director never appears on stage, and it has an empty chair with no name on it. In that sense, uh, I had questions that could not be resolved by the assets of my own culture, but I am fortunate enough to have met the Dharma through friends in Hungary. I didn't have to go longer than a 15-minute bus ride from my own place to the next Zen center in 1990, which is a big thing. So through a friend's recommendation and based on previous attempts, I found this tradition. And the moment I chanted our mantras, which we actually use in ordinary Zen as well, something got deeper, far from being resolved, but more peaceful, more relaxed. The mirror was already closer to being unbroken. And I could see that this is a good path for those who want it, including myself. And then came the challenge. So you got first a little reward of peace, that you don't have to play your roles all the time. You can actually withdraw. You can come off the stage. And although you're not yet the director, you don't attain that yet, you're not playing those roles so hard not so frantically anymore. The challenge was the Kongan practice. And some people in this room can tell you how challenging that is. Unresolved questions. And if you're a smarty and you know your way around in your brain and you don't find the answer, it bugs you. It irritates you. I call this the healthy sense of irritation, which translates into motivation. 
Because you want to find the answer. But for that, you have to lose your thinking habits. You have to come back to no mind or clear mind. And for me, the first three years in Zen was far from pleasant, but it was reassuring. It didn't promise anything. It didn't reward me. It never did. But it got me to experiences where I could really transcend the person who I was. And that's what decided that I'm staying, not because I like the chanting or I like the meditation techniques or the iconography or whatever. So it wasn't the aesthetic appeal, it wasn't the textual pleasure of reading some wonderful things. That came later. For that I had to change. And since I saw that this is a good way of transcending the self that is inflicting suffering upon itself and the world, I stayed. And ultimately it translates into loyalty to your teacher, to your tradition, and ultimately to yourself. I'm not exactly sure how to frame this into a question, but you spoke just a little bit ago about um, human beings being a very, have a, having a very short time on this planet. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. we so, develop version 2.0 and we can live, but right. with this one, very risky. Go on. It is, and it, and and I think most, if not most, of us would be in agreement with you, even if you look at COVID. Um, we hear more on the news now about what that's doing to our stock market and our economy than what it's doing to people's lives. As more and more people are waking up, and I believe more and more of us are, and especially the younger generations, how do we help propel that further? How First we of all, we have to distinguish uh, the primary fact that there is a virus from our reactions to it. So the virus is not crashing the stock market. People who are in fear, they do. So if we reacted different and we understood cause and effect differently, we would have very different reactions. I've just talked to a healthcare professional. She walked straight into our retreat. And afterwards, we had a nice conversation. And uh, she said, scientifically speaking, and based on her years-long experience in the healthcare industry, almost everything human beings have done about this virus, how to contain it and treat it, is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And that's why, you know, out of our own ignorance, we resort to measures that don't work because we cannot take cause and effect for what it is. And in this case, it's just pure science, clear medical science, how to contain it, how to treat it. And when you don't do that, then you have to quarantine half of Italy. And there's fear on the eastern seaboard how far this spreads out of New York or in the West Coast, what's going to happen to California and all the cruise ships, you know, that cannot dock. So that's way after we reacted wrongly to it. The virus doesn't have a mind of its own. It is a biological cause and effect machine. We have a mind, human beings, and we do not react clearly to it. And that's how immature we are as a species. In fact, do you know the worst virus on Earth? that keeps spreading and wrecks the planet? Humans. Homo sapiens. Yeah, that's it. No, Sounds about right. We're, we're parasites. We are the worst because we also destroy ourselves. Most parasites do not destroy themselves. Look at a Petri dish, exponential growth. And that was the point in the question. We, we worship the dollar right now. That's what we worship. More than, more than the people that are dying. We're worried about the stock market crashing because we're worshiping the dollar. <laughs> So the question is, as more and more people are waking up, and I yeah. believe more and more of us are, how do, we kind of, how do we propel that forward? How do we move this faster? Or, or? That we have a better perspective and a better plan for correct action than those who are more destructive and more ambitious and more selfish. And it's pretty hard to do this, but we can. First of all, is practicing. And I'm not pushing the Zen envelope. It's really increasing our own qualities, developing ourselves to a better human being. It's point zero. It's really the ground zero of any change you want to make. So be the change you want to manifest in the world. Familiar? Mm -hmm. It's true. Next, communication. Correct, honest, direct, unimpeded communication. With that, a network can appear. The network is always stronger than one mesh or one individual or a small group. And then, question mark, who knows? Because Earth is not really a user-friendly place if we are ignorant, and we are. 
and it can be paradise if we approach m Mother Nature in the right way. And the reason that we are having so many difficulties, we are lacking so many things and we are doing bad things is just our own ignorance, greed and anger. Nothing else. No one else. It's us. Our karma, our unresolved mindsets, our delusions, the whole package. You say people are waking up. I agree. Do we wake up fast enough? That's the question. Do we have enough awakened people? That's another question. Throughout history, you could always see that suffering based on greed, anger and ignorance is always faster and always more numerous than the enlightened beings that this culture on earth, I mean human culture in general, could produce. So go for the quality inside and outside. And then we can make this world a better place just by making ourselves a better human being, because I don't see any other way. We talk about many kinds of crises. Did you know that if we harnessed less than 1% of all solar energy hitting Earth, we could totally provide energy to everyone without fossil fuels? We've known this for over 50 years. What have we done? The rest is yours to discover. This has been a uh, really nice, a really good uh, session. And thank you, you know, as usual, for the knowledge and wisdom you bring to us. You normally put these on YouTube where we can review it. I mean, I would send out the link to our newsletter subscribers Definitely. so they could. I'll be sending uh, you the link, of course. This will be just edited, you know, the noise is taken out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it is published on YouTube, and I'm happy to say that now we have enough talks, uh, both in OZS and here, that we would have an individual Sarasota playlist. How about we, that? We got to that <laughs> point. So you will get the playlist, and you can play all the historical talks here and in Fruitville. And again, I really sincerely appreciate your hospitality and Will's openness to have me here. Wow. You're a remarkable person, and we're happy to have you. Uh, any other questions? If not, we'll wrap it up. Sure. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for your precious attention tonight. That attention radiating through your eyes, manifesting in your clear hearing and processing what I have said is the asset. We don't have to go any further. So please keep your awareness clear, your attention focused, your mind operational. And if we practice the path, we can all wake up, attain enlightenment, and save all beings from suffering, thus making this world a better place. Thank you very much.